Welcome to the Carolina Weather Group. I'm Scotty Powell. This week, we are kicking off a new multi-part series talking about our industry's rising stars. We're going to be talking to 12 meteorology students currently studying in different colleges around the country. What drove these kids into weather? How did they pick their school? And what they hope to accomplish all in this field of study is all we're going to be discussing over the next few weeks. We talked with these students across multiple recording sessions, but what you'll see is a little bit from all of them. And if you're hungry for more and you want it now, be sure to unlock early access to this series by subscribing to us on our Patreon page. Now, let's meet our students, Dylan Hudler, Jake Cartson, Ethan Clark, Eric Ilberg, Robert Zott, Justin Buninski, Katie Melvin, Andrew Mezern Smith, Chandler Pruitt, Jack Kendrick, and Brianna Fox. And now let's meet our Carolina Weather Group panelists who will be asking the questions on camera and behind the scenes. Here's Frank Strait, Evan Fisher, Shay Gibson, and Dan Whitaker. We'll throw out our first question, like we always do with our guest. And uh, Dylan, I'll start with you since you're kind of just okay. right beside me on the screen. Uh, how? What is your weather story? How did you uh, get uh, kind of ripped in into this crazy weather world? It's always been a passion and interest of mine. Ever since I was young, uh, we have a little brick uh, patio, if you will, in front of a fireplace in our home. And I would stand up there maybe twice a week or so. And right after Laney Pope came on WXI 12 and went to Salem for the six o'clock news or, or whatever, I'd stand up there and give a mock weather forecast um, in my diaper. And it was not, not accurate at all, but man, we had a fun time. I think I was just freaking terrified of lightning and thunderstorms when I was a kid. And from that came kind of an appreciation for the power of weather um, from a very young age. Um, it really wasn't like one experience that kind of steered me in towards the field. But I guess if I could point to something, um, it would be basically family recollections of this tornado, an F4 tornado that hit my hometown of Oak Lawn, Illinois in 1967. Um, this went right through the middle of town, basically destroyed the high school that I would have went to had I stayed in Illinois um, through high school um, and was, you know, pretty big deal for, you um, for that entire town. It was actually, I believe, the most deadly tornado in Chicagoland history. I guess the weather bug first bit me in the fifth grade. Uh, we were taking the daily high and low temperatures. And since then, it's kind of sparked my interest uh, living here in Houston on the Gulf Coast. Uh, also in the seventh grade, Hurricane Ike came. And I remember like the week prior, they shut down schools, they shut down grocery stores. Everyone either evacuated or you stayed put. Um, fortunately for us, the area which I lived in didn't really flood too much. It was just a bunch of rain. We had power outages. Um, and I remember sitting there with a the candle on and I was just packing with the coordinates that I heard. Like on, We had like a portable radio, just packing the coordinates. My mom has a thousand stories of me that's weather related where I'm always looking up in the sky or whenever it would rain, I'd want to go outside. Um, but the big thing was when I was six or seven, I would constantly watch the weather channel. I would go to my grandmother's house because she had Time Warner Cable and she had the Weather Channel, and she would offer to cut on Nickelodeon or Disney Channel, and I'm like, no, Storm Stories is about to start. I remember Katrina was the one storm that I really followed super closely as a kid um, and was just very dedicated to learning more about it and, and, and figuring things out. I remember being a, a kid and watching the far outer rain bands of Irene come in and just being, you know, glued to the window, even though we weren't really getting anything. And... Um, you know, some teacher told me along the way that, hey, you can actually do that as a career. You can study weather for a career. So I started looking into that and started my college search for that. And now here I am. But it was kind of just a series of multiple failed events. Um, so I lived in Southern Illinois for six years and we would constantly get these tornado warnings. And my mom, being a Southerner, would go out in the porch um, and look for the uh, uh, storms, kind of like in, uh, impersonating a Midwesterner, but kind of sort of. Um, but then she would tell me to get inside. So um, I guess not a full Midwesterner. Uh, but she she constantly looked at the clouds. And so I would try to find the tornado, but I'd just find Scud. I didn't know Scud at the time, though. I was just like, it's a tornado. Um, Mom would be like, no, that's not a tornado. Um, and then finally, she was like, okay, let me show you a video of a tornado. I have no clue what tornado this was i think it was just like a funnel cloud that happened that day uh, but she showed it and i was like oh that's super cool and then i just 
got hooked from there and I started looking up um, more information. I uh, went to the local library and such and just got hooked. I don't know much about the beginnings myself because I was very young, but my mom always tells me that when I was about two, I would stand up in front of the TV when the weatherman was on and you know, just stand there and pretend to point um, just like whoever was on TV. And it just kind of grew from there. As I got older, I watched Twister. I got into the show Storm Chasers when that was on TV. My passion for weather started at a very young age. So um, I, I'd say give or take at the age of four. It's one of my first memories ever. I remember being outside playing with my mom and just in the distance of a thunderstorm and there's CG after CG. Eventually, my mom's like, hey, look in through the living room, win- or living room window and see there's a red bar on the bottom of the screen. Have you watched the Weather Channel at any point in the 2000s, early 2010s? you remember this little red bar at the bottom of the screen anytime there's any type of severe warning with a little beep. As at a very young age, I realized that bar had a significance attached to it because after I said that the bar was there, she said we had to go inside. And so from then on out, I'd watch the Weather Channel religiously, so much to the point that... Uh, my relatives would jokingly call me the Justin on the H just because I would, I would always want to be there at, at the eighth minute of every 10 minutes. Dallas-Fort Worth, obviously tornadoes, but it seems like you guys get nailed with hell events at least once a year. What is that like? I mean, here in the Carolinas, we normally see quarter size, maybe golf ball. If we're lucky and it's really bad at baseball size hell, but you guys get a large hell. What What is that like? What's the sound like when that's happening? I have to say that I've been a little spared over the last few years. We definitely have got our, our share of having to replace a roof and, oh, our car is outside. We forgot to bring it in. But there have been some areas, particularly, I think there was a storm a few weeks ago in North Fort Worth where they had enormous hail. And we've, the most I've seen at my house, I think is about two and a half inches, somewhere two and a half, three. So, but I think Fort Worth, they had around four. And there was one just north of San Antonio that had like six inches recently or something. I don't remember the exact total, but I have to say that it is a fun experience, fun in the manner of uh, you don't know what's going to happen. You start hearing all these, it's like the sound of, I, I don't would want to say maybe pots and pans on the roof. It's just this sort of bang, bang, bang. And you're like, well, is my roof going to, at some points it feels like your roof's just going to completely fall through, but then you, you make your way through it and you just kind of take up your losses and, well, we got to replace the roof. I got to say one thing that is a memory that I do remember from a bunch of our storms is seeing the hail going into the pool. It's kind of crazy. They just hit the pool and all the water sploshing up. It's just such a wild sight to see. We definitely do get our share of tornadoes, but it seems to be decreasing a little bit. So I think hail is going to become our new thing here in the next few decades. Uh, what are some of those bigger storms that, that you remember? And maybe how did going through that make you want to become a meteorologist? Because, you know, meteorology is about studying weather, but it's also making sure that people are prepared. So uh, how, how did the uh, experience in these bigger events uh, really get you ready for studying weather? I would say the three Big hurricanes that I do remember are Hurricane Ike, Hurricane Rita, and Hurricane Harvey. Of course, Hurricane Harvey being the most catastrophic of all three of those storms. Um, but I remember Hurricane Harvey just being a really strong storm that came and hit the city of Houston. Um, like I mentioned earlier, my area, which I lived in, wasn't hit as hard as the inner city of, of Houston. Um, but I do remember just power being out for, for about a week and a half, two weeks, people not having enough water, not having enough food. Uh, people coming from in, in all across the country trying to help those who are stuck in their homes due to the flooding. Um, and it was just a really scary situation for those who were really impacted by it. Uh, as far as Hurricane Rita, I remember evacuating. I believe it was towards San Antonio. Uh, and I remember us filling up on gas, on those portable red gas tanks, or, or gas containers sorry, that you can get because traffic was just really bad. Um, and then Hurricane Ike, uh, I remember that one because the news station, they did a one year after the storm commemorative like uh, program, and I bought that DVD just so I could watch it on replay. So the winter storm of December 8th through 10th, 2018 is probably the first one that got me interested because I was able to find, I found an online weather forum, which has kind of helped like help me learn and help me grow in that interest. But that storm is sort of a love-hate relationship for me because um we got absolutely screwed here. Um, I went to bed with, I think, a five-inch forecast from GSP, and I ended up with about, 
maybe two and a half, mainly sleet. Um, and I think Landrum in the northern part of the county got like 10 inches. Um, Was that winter storm Diego? Yeah, I think that's what the Weather Channel called it. You know, you, you mentioned the winter storm. I think that's, Evan, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, that's the uh, the last big winter storm that a lot of us had here in Western North Carolina. The start of my Twitter account was because of Hurricane Florence, actually. Um, so I created one that day as it was raining cats and dogs um, in Charlotte. And then my parents were like, let's ship you around the South Charlotte area and let's try to find flood damage and all this different stuff. And I got to basically kind of act like a TV meteorologist for a little bit. Uh, so it was, it was great. That's my dad awesome. with his big, huge jacked up truck, just like, <laughs> um, but it, it was an awesome experience. Let me ask this. Cause I know in the past, I've seen a lot of schools that have meteorology degrees or they have meteorology programs, broadcast forecasting, any, anything of that na- nature. But um, wh- who of you, is actually getting forecast skill development in your curriculum. Is that is that a class that's offered, like where you actually learn how to forecast? You're learning all about the atmosphere and weather dynamics and everything, but is anybody teaching that nowadays? From what I understand, I obviously have not made it to campus yet, so I don't have too much information. I do know we have two meteorology classes for first semester, so I'm pretty excited about that. But um, we have six different options for meteorology at Penn State. So um, there is a forecasting explicit area that's just for forecasting development and skills. So um, there's like classes that you can just take for forecasting development skills. And then there's five other different sections that you can take. Besides the aforementioned storm chase, Virginia Tech, uh, I would say the program, you know, we have like Eric who's talking about a broadcast based program, uh, Robert who mentioned tropical tech is uh, they prioritize forecasting, at least from what I've experienced so far. And so, uh, your freshman and sophomore year, you're, uh, any student that attends, I'll have David Carroll as a professor. Great professor, by the way. Amazing, amazing guy. Um, and he preaches to you very early on synoptics, top-down method. You know, don't get caught up in the mesoscale stuff. You know, always look at synoptics first. And from there on, he teaches you. So at least so far, I've learned so much about how to forecast um, whether it be like hydrometer classification, the seeding temperatures, all these little things that I would have never thought of before. He, he makes sure to just hit them one after the other after the other. And um, this is aided by having the National Weather Service, uh, Blacksburg, based in the same city as we are. And so there's a capstone program every semester, or every fall semester, I think, where there's two students that work directly with the National Weather Service. And so as you can imagine, tech has a really, really, really good job placement rate with the National Weather Service for forecasting positions. Um, I think we we have, I know we have some in Alaska, Florida, El Paso, State College, they're they're all over the place. So I would say that tech really emphasizes forecasting. I know you've had some really unique internships with the city of Raleigh and WRAL. So uh, can you let us in? Uh, You've already said about Raleigh, I'm sure WRAL is going to miss you. So I'm sure you'll you'll probably be back in the studio as much as you can to help them out too, right? Yep. So I'm basically just going to be like I'm considered a helper um, for now because I can't really do too much virtually for broadcast purposes. Um, well, especially if you're on the field, you can't really do that from Penn State. But uh, so I'll definitely be back um, in the summer for sure. Um, but for the city, I had fortunate enough to have a cool experience working in the city of Raleigh's stormwater division and um, emergency management. They have actually um, decided to extend my internship for another year. So I'll be working virtually, very flexible, which I'm very fortunate that they're letting me do that um, from Penn State. So I will continue to definitely be posting stuff for Raleigh and North Carolina because I'll still actively be involved while I'm away. That's great. One thing about Virginia Tech, though, Justin, is you guys have, uh, I know a lot of schools do this, but I follow it on social media a lot. You guys have your own storm chase team that you guys go out into the the plains and and, uh, take a couple weeks and and chase. So uh, have you been on that yet? And if not, can you tell a little bit about uh, a little bit about the program? I actually just went out west this year with Virginia Tech. Uh, That was an amazing experience. I would do it again gladly. Um, so the way it is, is you have a little group of about 16, 15 students, um, a couple TAs, which happened to be Aaron Swigget with National Weather Service in Raleigh, and Alex Thornton, who is a uh, Hokie alumni. 
So you go out west, and <clears throat> you're, everything that you do, you have to forecast. It, it's all your own work. And so it's one thing to learn about storms and how they form and all these sorts of mesoscale topics, even synoptic topics, in the classroom. But to actually be out in the field, having to, you know, top-down method, let's look at synoptics, let's look at mesoscale, you know. We pick this target or this target because you can only be in one place at a time and you know not only thinking about your chase for that day but then you know hey where do i got to be in two days you know or this jet looks like it's gonna really or this trough looks like it's gonna dig in out west in like a couple days but wisconsin looks like a great play day one you know so you have all these little variables that you have to look over as a group with um not a lot of experience up to that point for most and then it paid off at least for us this year we actually uh we went out west at the same time as that death ridge that brought all those record highs out to the Pacific Northwest. So we were like, man, we could not have chosen a worse week <laughs> to have this trip, um, which it was delayed because of COVID. Uh, we knew that regulations would probably lessen the further we got. And so we went out west, and I, I personally didn't expect to see anything. I was looking at 500 millibar plots, and, you know, there's nothing because that, that ridge is just taking everything away from us. It's all in Canada. So we instead, our professor hinted to us that we should probably bet on Colorado Mountain Magic. You know, I was like, ah, that just doesn't seem like a good idea. He was absolutely correct. Uh, we had a, a tornado worn supercell on like our third day, I believe. It took us two days to get out west, and then our first actual day chasing a storm in just its own outflow boundary and becomes tornado worn. And then from there on out, you know, it's just hey, let's hang out in Colorado, and then, oh, short waves digging in four days from now. Let's start moving towards Texas in preparation for that. But overall, it was an amazing experience. You get to know your peers, you get to make uh, relationships with your professor and the uh, the TAs that are on the trip, like Aaron, who will be in the National Weather Service. So, you know, he's there giving you knowledge. You're surrounded by knowledge, you're surrounded by peers, and you're surrounded by storms. So it's really a win-win-win situation. It's been a tough year. Um, been a tough couple of years for students, both high school and college, um, and those graduating from college trying to find jobs. Have you guys experienced any burnout in your schooling? And if so, how have you dealt with it? Uh, Brianna, got a big nod, so I'm going to go to you first. COVID hit for me right in the middle of getting into some of our more core meteorology classes. So uh, I was in Dynamics 1 when COVID first became prevalent, and we got word that school was kind of shutting down and going online and that was rough not only for having such a core class online but our professor also had not had to teach a course online before so not only were we going through an adjustment of being at home and getting through online work but most of our professors were also making that adjustment as well so getting through that class um, advanced dynamics things like that was very, very tough. I did mesoscale online and it just made it a lot harder. I think the worst part was just not having interaction with both classmates and your professors because you're just kind of sitting at your desk and you log on to Zoom and you go to class and then you sit and do homework and it just became such a process of feeling like you just wake up and you're at your desk for 10 hours or however many hours and then you go to bed and just repeat. So the burnout was definitely felt in that aspect because it just was a continuous, it felt like all I did was go to bed and wake up and school was my life even more so than it normally is because you don't get to really talk to people. <laughs> I took a gap year this year just because it was so overwhelming last spring. Um, and I, I have so much respect for y'all for going to school this last year. I, I just can't imagine and you guys are incredibly strong for doing that. Uh, Chandler. You were, let's see, were you a freshman last year or a sophomore last year? Freshman. What was it like for you starting off at a uh, school? <laughs> well, at least I didn't know what I missed out on. So, <laughs> you know, um, uh, I would say one of the biggest issues that I had was, I mean, basically I was just doing everything on the computer. Yeah. By the end of the day, I wanted to smash my computer. <laughs> uh, like I was just done with it, man. Uh, uh, and like, you know, the freshman 15. Um, I thankfully didn't experience it, but it was so hard to not 
just mm-hmm. because you're not even walking to classes now. So you're really having to put effort into actually working out um, mm-hmm. in order to not get that freshman 15. Um, and it was, uh, it was difficult in that regard. And it was difficult as far as like, um, you know, getting connected with some of these groups because some of the clubs just did not meet others met entirely online. And for like one of the clubs I was a part of climbing club, you know, there's nothing you can do online. Uh, So it was kind of just like, Oh, this is boring. Uh, But, but it did make experiences such as FSU weather, which is the TV production. um, It made that so much richer. Um, I was able to build bonds with um, a lot of the upperclassmen and, seniors that are meteorology majors that um, started to give me tidbits of information from their classes. So I already knew, also knew what professors, like how to prepare for them, Mm -hmm. what, you know, they, how they like to teach and that kind of stuff. So it was a better bonding experience as far as in major field goes. Um, It's just as far as like outside of the major, it was kind of hard. Jack, what about you? I know you're going through your your senior year of high school, Um, not necessarily into the meteorology studies yet, but as a senior in high school, what was that like? So COVID hit, I was a junior. And that was, honestly, it was a godsend because my classes became, my teachers didn't know how to handle it. And they just got a lot easier because they were just giving us busy work assignments. And I wasn't like drowning. I was doing all right. But like my grades went up a ton because of it. Uh, what is your worst school-related bad dream or maybe a bad real-life experience? I'll let you pick. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> One of the pitfalls of grad school is, especially when you're kind of working in modeling world like I do, um, you build large amounts of data. And oftentimes, you need really fancy computers to be able to generate said data. And you also need a large um, amount of storage to hold said data. Um, and there was one time a while back where I was building a a simulation, um, where I was kind of like trying to round out this suite of, of, of model runs that I was doing. And, um, ultimately one of the worst things that you can do in, um, pro in programming or kind of running a command line or anything like that is doing RM space star. (laughs) <laughs> usually you want to give yourself the option to say yes or no or moving certain things that you don't need but um me instinctually wanting to clear up some space decided to do that and basically wiped all my data Ooh. so a lot of times when you're running big simulations you have a limited number of like core hours they call it on the supercomputer um so basically like a limited amount of data that you can generate so i didn't have that problem with that but it did waste me about two weeks of my life which you know, that's a big deal in and of itself. Yeah. So one must be careful probably, with RM star. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh. There's probably other, uh, there's probably other ones out there, but that's, that's the first one that comes to mind. All right. You're a senior, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, are you thinking of going to grad school at all, or are you, are you confident that you're ready to enter the workforce once you uh, have your degree? So I originally was going to do the uh, master's program, the online master's program, uh, but because I just entered like the professional workforce, I wasn't sure how I was going to be able to balance a master's degree or because the, the program I'm in right now is a certification. So it's not per se like your quote unquote degree. It's more of a certificate to get into broadcasting. Um, so I've definitely thought about it. Um, as of right now, I think we're going to try to get my foot into the broadcasting door and then possibly while I'm working, in the broadcasting industry, maybe work on my master's degree at the same time, see if it works out. Yeah, that's that's ambitious, but it can be done. Yeah. Um, let's see, Justin, you're the junior, right? Okay, uh, what are you thinking about uh, post-graduation at this point? National Weather Service, ideally. I'm really, really hoping I can get a capstone and work with them directly. Um, even beyond the capstone, uh, they have the, the Mesonet project going on right now where they're working with Virginia Tech to get all these weather stations in place in the public to fill in little gaps in the you know, the ops, how do you want to describe it? Gaps in observations, basically, due to how mountainous and rural this part of the state is, um, along with the tornado survey project that they have going on with drones, actually, which Virginia Tech was assisting with prior to COVID. I'm not sure when they're going to resume it. It probably depends on how regulations are looking. But beyond that, um, I'm not really considering grad school just because I really want to start working. I want to start forecasting. You know, I, I don't want any of this extra stuff. I want to get in the field and get moving. But 
Tech does have good grad school placement rates. Uh, we just had two of my friends actually that graduated. Uh, they're going to OU this upcoming semester for uh, their grad school, go pursuing masters. And then if not the National Weather Service, I'd probably go into the private sector. As one of the many companies that are in need of employees at the moment, just to get some forecasting going. And then hopefully later on down the road, after having some experience, then get into the National Weather Service. Weather was one of the biggest things that emergency management had to focus on day in and day out. So I'm assuming, Matt, that that's kind of what, what you want to to look through? Or? Uh, it's actually not, um, okay. surprisingly. I, uh, just for the listeners, I've been I've been in emergency services, uh, the fire service, and uh, I've worked the past five years as a paramedic. Uh, I've been in emergency services for about 10 years now, actually. Um, and... Uh, I love both aspects. I love meteorology. I love the emergency services, but I, I don't know if I personally would enjoy like putting them together. And the problem is it's such a, it can be such a, a niche field um, because not every County, not every city has an emergency management department. So it can almost be a little bit difficult. I, if I remember correctly, and it may be several years out of date here, but uh for the Charlotte area, Charlotte Mecklenburg is, they have an emergency management department, but it kind of covers multiple counties almost. Um, and they hire from within, at least the last time I've had any kind of interaction with them. And so, and, and they only have like maybe two or three because somewhere the size of Charlotte, roughly a million people, they only have like two or three emergency managers. So kind of getting into that is a little bit more difficult. I'm more interested in um, National Weather Service. I'm more interested in, in like research. Uh, I've, I've just getting into my master's and doing my master's thesis research. I've, I've really fallen in love with that. Um, I think down the line, I'd actually be very interested in being a professor, um, teaching information, this kind of information to the upcoming generations, as well as being able to work on research and and do so in a more uh, academic setting. Our campus has UNCC weather, which is our broadcasting section. Whenever I was technically a freshman first started, the senior Danielle used her scholarship money to create a studio. And she was very kind and friendly and she you know, let me try it out and see what I thought. And I really liked it. For a long time, I didn't feel like comfortable or confident enough to do broadcasting. I didn't think it was really for me. And then once I started and tried it out, I was like, oh, this is really fun. I like being in front of the screen and like getting the forecast. I think it's really fun. I added a broadcast minor last year. So, um, you know, if I do like it, then I'll be able to have that and go into that after school. That being said, my number one is still private sector. And I am really hoping to go into some business like Amazon is, is needs forecasters for their drone service or maybe Delta Airlines or something like that. Coming up next week, more of our college series. We're going to be learning about the programs at each school, what drew each meteorology student to the school, and learn a little bit more about what's going on on campus and surrounding the campus area. Please stay subscribed, or better yet, join us on Patreon, and you can unlock part two right now. Why wait? Otherwise, we'll see you next week here for another episode of the Carolina Weather Group.